So, welcome to Global Reach's monthly grip tips and training sessions. We do this every Thursday, the first Thursday of every month at 10 a.m. Last month was a little off because I actually had to have surgery. So, we ended up having to, or my son did actually, and so we had to change things around. But um, we do this every month, and sometimes we talk about, um, you know, best practices for site viz. Other times it's WordPress. Um, and lately, a lot, it's been about digital marketing. Now, next month, we plan on talking about how you can use digital marketing to um, to help with the recruiting process and, and help find talent, keep talent, develop talent, um, and that sort of thing beyond using just simply Indeed or LinkedIn or whatever. So if you find this presentation valuable, please, please um, make sure you RSVP for the next one as well, because um, more and more of my personal consulting sessions with clients have been spent on that topic. Um, but ironically, the topic that we're covering today, which is SEO copywriting and copywriting in general, um, actually plays very, very well um, into next month's training as well, because without proper copy, it's hard for a job to get found unless you're paying a lot of money. And my, my goal is to help people find great talent without having to pay a lot of money to do it um, or meet whatever goals they have without having to pay a lot of money to do it. I, I'm I have nothing against Google ads or anything like that, but um, anything that we can do to uh, help you organically is going to help overall. So the format of this training and all of the grip tips and training sessions is that we spend the first half hour talking about um, about whatever the topic is. It's going to be a presentation followed by um, 30 minutes of Q&A. So any questions that you have, um, feel free to hold on to till the end and we will be happy to address them. Now, it doesn't have to be about the subject at hand. We usually have Eleni is one of our uh, uh, fantastic account managers um, and she's handled a lot of projects. She's really great about just about every piece of content. We usually also have sometimes designers, other digital marketing experts. So there's people from all everything we do essentially um, that can help answer any questions you might have. So uh, definitely grab a notebook and pen if you, or a notebook and pen, notebook, paper, whatever, um, pencil, heck, write it down with a Crayola if you want to, but you're gonna wanna take notes because there's some really interesting stuff in here. Um, also any resources that I mentioned can be provided to you. Just uh, email us seo at globalreach.com and let us know that you'd like it and we'd be happy to send that out to you. Uh, and that includes this this presentation. So without further ado, uh, I will go ahead and jump into this. And again, in case anyone's joined the room, I used to get notifications when people joined the room, but I turned that off because people are joining like crazy. Um, you can also ask questions in the chat um, and I, that way I can get to it when the Q&A happens um, or one of the others can as well. Um, but the entire presentation will be um, shared via this video on YouTube on uh, possibly on Facebook. We, we do it quite a few different places. But again, thank you very much for joining us. So today what we plan to cover in, in this SEO copywriting masterclass, if you will, this is a gra crash course in brain surgery, is how to build out your content, um, understanding what it is that you want to do, why you're doing it, um, and then how to perform proper keyword uh, research and competitive analysis. We're going to talk about how to outline your content properly to make it more digestible. Uh, we'll talk about really thinking through a little bit deeper in the flow of your content so you can keep people hooked and provide a really good experience, good value, and then filling in the blank how to actually completely finalize your content, build it out much deeper. Um, and then, like I said, I'll, I'll give you some final, final tips on what to do next, and then we'll open the floor to uh, Q&A. So SEO copywriting is really, really important because um, getting found on Google, if you know how to write content in a way that is um, more competitive uh, because you've done your research and you've done your work, it, the overall, it's, it's a competitive advantage. You're going to steal more attention. You're going to grab more uh, people. You're going to have more conversion. So that's why this is all very important. Now, I will, I'm going to mention this stat, this, this uh, fact now so that I don't forget later because I don't think I put it in the slides and I, it's a very important uh, fact. But in order for content to be considered a blog or a news article, it needs to be at least 300 character or 300 words. So I'm sorry, I said three, 600 at least 600 words. So um, once your content is 600 words, Google will index it as a blog or index it as a, um, as a news article and it has higher value. Um, 
so what the latest Google algorithms want is they want to provide not only the best experience, which is and the best results, it's an answer machine first and foremost, but they want to make sure that you are adding to the overall collective intelligence and expertise of the internet, essentially. So they don't really want you to just, you know, replicate or duplicate other content out there. They want original content that's that's informative and, you know, serves a really decent purpose. So the reason to keep that in mind is that you know, this isn't necessarily just about blogging. It's about anything that you that you write for content on the internet, because copywriting for SEO and for digital marketing purposes um, is way different than just about anything else. And the sales aspect, the marketing aspect, the design aspect, it all has to flow cohesively to get the desired result. So. When, when you're doing content, what you might do is if you have older blogs that have performed well, like you look at your Google Analytics and you see that a blog from 2017 is the highest trafficked blog on your website, then you may want to reevaluate that and see what you can do to update it. Because anytime you make an update like that, Google re-indexes it and it likes fresh content because it shows that you're an authoritative figure on that specific uh, subject and that you're giving more relevant content. Um, so again, competitive advantage. So if you're going to be editing or writing content from scratch or reviewing, there's a few things to keep in mind. First off, who's your target audience? Who are you trying to talk to? You know, are these um, are these current customers? Are these potential customers or prospects? Um, is this, you know, who is it that you're trying to reach to as a potential business partners? Understand what you want them to get out of it. What, are they, what, are they, what do you want them to do with that information? Because if you have a great set of information there that's just informative, you know, what's the purpose of this content? If it's just informative and to show that you're an expert, great, you give this great info, but if there's no call to action at the end, if there's no um, next steps, or if you're not helping with that, then they're just gonna go, okay, cool, click and click out of there because they've gotten the information they need and they don't know what to do with it next, so they'll move on. So what do you want them to do with that information? And these are things that you should write down. Who's my target audience? And this is while you're planning out your content. Who's my target audience? What do I want them to do with the information I'm gonna provide? And what might someone search for in Google to find this page? So what I'm asking you to do is a little bit of um, specific keyword research, essentially, and we'll get a little bit deeper into that, but basically, what kind of things might they search for? I'm talking headlines, I'm talking keywords. I mean, anything that you would that you would want them to search for to find whatever your content is, uh, whether that's a video, a blog, it doesn't matter. So having that in mind, that's that's great first steps. The next thing is um, there's there's three main types of content. And there's obviously many, many subsets, but these are the three primary types of content and reasons that you would want to build this out. The first one is is informative. So an informative uh, piece of, of content provides information. Um, there's a, a specific purpose of answering a question or a series of questions. So for example, a great informative page would be an FAQ page that lists out frequently asked questions and then answers those questions. FAQ questions also make great headers for your content because Google, because it's an answer machine, wants to find answers that are formatted in a way that answers the question that's been asked. So is this meant to be informative? Now, is it meant to be educational? So there's a difference between informative and educational. Informative is basically question answer type of thing, right? You're giving specific information with a specific question that someone has, and you're trying to answer that. Educational really goes a little bit deeper, and it kind of it shows your industry expertise. It lets them know, like a white paper would be a great educational piece. Um, a long form blog that's you know five to 7,000 words would be a great educational piece. So you want something that really goes deep and, and shows insights that you have that go beyond answering the question and provide real value. This, for example, this form of content that we're doing right now is a great educational uh, type of content. And the third one is entertainment. Uh, it's designed, entertainment is, you know, most, it's it's funny, it almost sounds like it's a, it's a bad word, but with entertainment, it's about making your content more relatable. Um, a lot of businesses, including big businesses, Pepsi, that sort of thing, they'll use memes. In fact, I saw uh, Heinz Ketchup, uh, the, the specifically the Canadian Heinz Ketchup, started creating these memes on their Twitter and they blew up, it went viral. So having different uh, content that's meant to entertain and engage people can make your brand seem a lot more approachable.
So when planning the content, having an idea of the purpose of the content, who you're trying to reach, what you're trying to do with that content is going to really help because you want to provide value first and foremost. Uh, if you're just, if every piece of content you put out is to try and sell people, you're doing it wrong. 80% of your content should be providing some kind of value and 20% of it should be asking for a sale. You have to earn that, a sale is a relationship, you have to earn that relationship uh, or conversion of any kind, whether it's download this white paper, download this PDF, you know, see this infographic, whatever, if it's a lead funnel generation thing, first you wanna explain why they should trust you. You have to gain that trust. The analogy I like to use is that uh, most guys won't ask a woman to marry them on the first date. It's just a fact. So moving on, uh, the next part we talk about is performing keyword research and competitive analysis. Uh, keywords are in incredibly powerful. So when I talk about keywords, um, excuse me, when I talk about keywords, there's actually quite a bit more than just certain keywords you want to hit. So say, for example, you want to hit, um, uh, uh, you know, roofing. Say you want to hit uh, new shingles or new roofing. So people search, they use search intent in different ways. So there's information seeking, there's per, uh, purchase, like in, purchase intent, intent to purchase, that sort of thing. And so the types of keywords that they type in to Google or any search algorithm, even if it's the voice algorithms, um, they do it in different ways. So if they are trying to info seek and they don't have a lot of info on it, then they'll do just a basic keyword. But generally they'll, they'll use um, related keywords or long tail keywords. So just because you know specific industry jargon doesn't necessarily mean that the, uh, that they'll have it, um, and that they'll know that info. So more commonly related keywords is a good way to look at related keywords. Long tail keywords are questions. But by including those things, you can get up to 69% higher engagement, meaning click through rate, and 81% higher organic discovery. So if you are just trying to hit one specific keyword and you put that in your meta description and in your title tag and in your H1 and all throughout, then you're keyword stuffing and Google knows that. And so that's not as valuable as finding related keywords. Generally, you wanna have a list of anywhere from 10 10 to 30 related keywords or, or the keywords you want to try and hit. And so by writing out all these keywords, um, you can really get an idea of what type of, um, what type of message you're trying to convey, how you're going to convey that message. And if you're not sure where to start, Google knows. Um, you can start with a simple keyword uh, search, search in Google, start typing it in. And again, you're going to want to have a notepad with you because you'll want to take notes on this too um, while you're doing this research. Uh, for related or long tail keywords, you can use Google's autocomplete. Now we've all seen it. You start typing something in and Google tries to guess what it is you're typing. That's not because it's annoying. It's because that's what most people search for. So that'll give you an idea of different headers, different ways that people phrase things. You know, it, it, geographically speaking, the way that I phrase something may be completely different than somebody on the East Coast, West Coast, or down South or up North from where I am, right? So understanding that will help you write content that reaches the, the, your demographic a little bit better. If you're trying to figure out what kind of ideas and FAQ, you can, uh, and short form content, that sort of thing, even again, extra headers, um, people also ask. So usually when you search for something, if you scroll down a little bit, there's a little box that says people also asked, and it has the uh, you know long tail keywords and and um, phrases that people are asking that are related. These, this is a great way to get more information. So you have to do a little bit of homework here. Uh, if you want to see what keywords perform better than others, you can use a great tool called trends.google.com. Google Trends is a fantastic tool that is completely underutilized, and most people don't even realize it's there. But how Google Trends works is you can you can click on you can search in a certain geographic location. You can take two different keywords and compare them side by side. So, for example, internet marketing. Uh, doesn't perform nearly as well as digital marketing. It used to. Internet marketing 10, 15 years ago was huge. Uh, but in the last five years and, and more recently, digital marketing has replaced that verbiage. So what Google Trends will show you is the search, the, generally the search volume and search trends of certain keywords. And you can compare four or five keywords at a time. It graphs it out over time. You can say, okay, I want to see you know, from this time to this time, whatever it may be, um, 
you can see all kinds of information. So Google Trends is a fantastic tool. Another great tool is called uh, Answer the Public. So answerthepublic.com allows you to do three per day for free, otherwise you have to pay for it. And what's great about that is it'll let you see deeper related keywords that are relevant in literally any country. Now by default, because the website was built in Great Britain, you'll notice that it actually starts in Great Britain. So you wanna switch it to America if you're in the United States or whatever country you're in but you can search for your keywords and it'll tell you related keywords, questions, all that stuff in one place and you can download it in the CSV. It'll even alphabetize the results for you and give you a great graphic that you can download. So it's a really good way to get all of your keyword research at once. The only downside is again, you can only use it three times per day for free. So you have to pay for an extra tool. Now, our department, the digital marketing department at Global Reach, actually has access to a, a large plethora of tools. We have keyword magic tools, and we, you know, we use um, Google Keyword Manager and things like that. that are, um, there, there's a lot of different tools that we use to go even deeper than all the things I've shown you. But if you're just starting out and you're just doing research, um, these are really easy, free ways to just start writing down ideas on what kind of content. Um, but what you're also doing at the same time as you're doing research is you're doing a little bit of competitive and complementary analysis, okay? So basically what you wanna do is you wanna check out the top three posts that are um, organic, they're related to your keyword. Um, the first three ones, not, not necessarily the ads because that's pay to place, but the first ones that come up organically or in the people also asked, and then really start looking into it. You know, what is it that, that if it's a blog, for example, or a video, what points did they make that I want to make sure I touch on that I can either that I can do better? I always say, don't keep up with the Joneses, be the Joneses, um, make people keep up with you. So, you know, I'm not talking about plagiarism by any means. And Google sees that, you know, uniqueness is one of the things that they that they keep an eye on. So you want to make sure you're um, using your research to create content that you can do better. Now, is it okay to use other industry experts? Absolutely. And if you do, make sure you link back to them. And I'll get back to that in a minute too. But the other side of it is complementary analysis. So think about the content that's currently on your website. What are past articles or other, other content that you've already created or has been created in the past that are a good supplement to what you've done? So at the end of the blog, you might say, um, or the end of the content, you might say, uh, if you like this content, check out and then have links to these other articles or throughout the blog, you can use it. So if you go to globalreach.com slash blog, you'll see that uh, in a lot of our blogs, we actually have header images that break up the content. Well, those images are actually uh, the banner image from past blogs. And if you click on it, they're related to the content that, that we're showing you and it'll take you to that other blog. It'll open it in a new tab so you don't lose your place. But it's a way of cross-linking and keeping people engaged, keeping them enticed and, and breaking up thicker content as you're doing it. So speaking of which, let's talk about how you take the gargantuan task of saying, I gotta write 600 to 800 words, I'm terrified, where do I start? Well, the good news is it's not as hard as you think. You start by outlining your content. You can turn that those long tail keywords into a really nice bullet pointed list. And here's why. The human brain craves order. Bullet points are a great way to really organize and categorize and, and build it out. In fact, it kind of acts like the skeleton of your content. You're able to um, make sure that you are hitting all of your main points and essentially you're outlining the points that you want to hit while also hitting those keywords um, organically. So the other nice thing about an outline is that say you write out this great blog and you finish everything up, you can take that same outline and you can give it to somebody else that is just as much an expert that you work with and say, hey, I did this research for you. I did all the hard work. Here's a bunch of keywords. Here's an outline I came up with. Do me a favor. Try to write a blog about this. Can you fill in the blanks for me? I need your expertise. And that's the thing. Appeal to ego and you'd be surprised how people are willing to help you out. So say things like, you know, I really would love your expertise here if you could help me out. Um, give me your take on this, I'm having trouble. Even if you're not, even if your blog is completely written, ask them to write something for you. The reason you wanna do that is because then you can take their quotes that they provide, their insights, their industry expertise, and you can either plug it into your current blog or a lot of times they'll write a completely different piece of content than what you came up with and you can repurpose it and use that as a, as a complimentary blog. So you get two pieces of content off of one blog. Also, you can use that same outline for a lot of supporting content. You can use it as a video outline. You can use it for doing a podcast or other audio. Um, you can have graphic design specialists. We have our graphic design team do this too. Build out uh, infographics that you can use. So there's a lot of different ways you can repurpose that content 
to support what you're already creating just by having a simple outline. Now, as you're writing, there's some things that you want to keep in line. You want to think, uh, think, uh, keep in mind. You want to think about the flow of content. So there is a really, really great um, digital marketing guy who who uh, specializes in Instagram, and his name is Simon Mitchell. He's from uh, I want to say either the UK or, or British Columbia. I'm not I'm not sure. I think he, he might be Canadian, but regardless, uh, he has this thing called the hit copy method. And the hit copy method is brilliant because if you keep this in mind while you're writing, you can use this method to write anything, whether it's a, a script for uh, for a video or a script, an outline for a podcast or even uh, textual content. It doesn't matter. This hit method is the way to go. The first one is H. You want to hook your audience with an attention grabbing and keyword filled headline. And you want to support that with immediate visual elements. So people are, are visual creatures, right? We click on the shiny object, right? Google or Facebook actually has a, a, a term for it, thumb stopping, right? So that very first thing should be something unique that catches their attention, piques their, their curiosity, if you will. In fact, the I stands for intrigue. You want to intrigue them with an introduction that teases the audience, leaves them wanting a little bit more and, and, you know, has them really wanting to be engaged. It's kind of like a cliffhanger. That's why, great example, that's why soap operas usually always ended on a cliffhanger when they were a thing. I don't know if they still are or not, but it's because it brings the audience back or keeps them going. So here's the kicker though. You really do have to pay off what you promise. The I in the double I hit method is inform. You need to, this is where you'll either inform, educate, or entertain, like we talked about before. You pay off the promise. You give a lot of value. You give your insight. You give your industry expertise. You link to other places. Make sure that if you do a cross link that it opens in a new window if it's outside your website. Fun tip. But this is where you pay it off. And then the third thing, or the, the fourth thing rather, is the T, which is trigger action. You do that with a strong call to action. So you've provided this great value. You've given these great insights. Now what? What am I going to do with this information? Do you want people to call, contact you? Do you want them to read more? Do you want them to subscribe? Whatever it is you want them to do, you want that information in there. So I've actually, you know, used this when helping people write content for um, for hiring when they're when they're going through the hiring process um, and they're writing out job descriptions that'll be on their website. Um, the headline isn't that hard. You, literally, it's it's the job title, right? The introduction is often some of the perks, some of the benefits. So people know that they need that they that there's a lot of jobs out there. Why should they work with you? You know, that's the hook. And then you give the intrigue. That's you know a little bit about this is why it's a great benefit to work with us. But here's what we need from you, and that's going into the inform. So here's the information that we need from you. Um, you have to have these qualifications. You have to have you know this is this is the salary. All, all that stuff. At the end, you usually have a trigger, which is, hey, uh, apply online, apply now. So you can actually take that trigger, or that button, that apply now, and you can put it right after the intrigue if you want and down at the bottom. So your call to action can be in multiple places on the website because at any point they could go, okay, enough said, shut up and take my money type of thing. Not to meme too much, but that's exactly what it is. It, it's, okay, I'm ready. What's the next step? So having that call to action is important. So Simon, uh, Simon uh, Mitchell's hit method is fantastic for writing just about any kind of copy. The last step is really easy. It's filling in the blanks. You want to consider the flow a little bit deeper. Okay. So you have all these great keywords. You have all this great stuff. You've put it in an outline. You know what you want your flow to be. You've written out an, a, a good introduction and you're, you're, you're feeling pretty good about it. So once you've taken that outline, you've filled that out, now what do you do? Well, you have to add your finishing touches. And this is where you go back and you tweak and you edit and you make it more SEO friendly. Um, we have one, so for Global Reach, you can hire us to do copywriting. And there's two different types of SEO copywriting. One is where you provide content to us and say, okay, this is what I've written, make it SEO friendly. And what we'll do is we'll do the keyword research, we'll find additional, uh, uh, all that stuff for you using our tools that go I've talked about here and then we'll go one step further and we'll actually organically sprinkle that throughout the content and then we'll break it up and we'll do all the things that follow SEO copywriting best practices such as using a proper hierarchy what I mean by that is headers so your your title the, the title of the page and your h1 header aren't going to be exactly the same but you can only have one h1 header per page so your h1 header if you're not familiar is the biggest piece of text and when I first started copywriting I thought that maybe it was just a format like a, a, a um, a font size. Well, that's not true. 
what headers are used for is not only to break up the content, but to kind of help guide the flow of it. So for example, an H1 is the primary subject. Everything in this blog or whatever is going to be that H1. An H2 is the first subsubject, sub subject, subheading, subcategory of that subject. And then other subpoints, it's the hierarchy. It's just like doing an outline like I have here. So this would be the, the first one, add finishing touches would be the uh, H2. An H3 would be um, use proper hierarchy and headers. H4, if I wanted, would be this giving you the example. And you can go, actually, Google has shown uh, in a in a survey of over 2 million blogs, they found that blogs that utilize up to an H4 uh, header perform seven times better than blogs that don't. And the reason for that is that the crawler is able to see a snapshot of what the content information is and provide answers and figure out what is best. So your headers should have some good keywords in there. So once you've made your supporting point, when you're ready to do a second supporting point, do another H2 and then continue the hierarchy and then another H2 um, until you're ready to end out the blog. Now, the second thing is you want to add supporting visual elements. So that is your video, that's images. Just make sure that you include alternate descriptions. You want to stay um, ADA compliant and uh, WCAG 2.0 compliant, which that's a whole other another grip tip session for that. But Basically, you want to make sure that you have um, a description of what it is for anybody who has to use adaptive technology. But also, Google has image searches, and a lot of times they'll use the alternate descriptions to help with image searching, which can bring people to your website another kind of backdoor way. The third thing is add internal crosslinks and external crosslinks. So the, when I said look for complementary content, those are internal crosslinks. Those can open in the same window if you want, or if it's early up in the in the content, maybe have it open in a new tab so that people don't lose their place. Um, and then external crosslinks are references. So if you, if you quote the CDC, make sure you cite your source and then add a link to that. And having that open in a new tab is great. So Google loves those because one, it helps the crawler get through your website. Two, it, it encourages people to engage with your content deeper and see related content, keeps them engaged. And three, it shows that you're not selfish and that you're willing to cite your source. So you're authoritative, but you also are willing to acknowledge that you're not the number one authority. Nobody likes arrogance to that level. Um, so that's that's a great idea. Another thing you can do is called anchor links and anchor text. And that's where you have like top level, some navigation in there that when somebody clicks on it, scrolls down halfway through the page to that spot. Um, that's a little more advanced and, and I'd be happy to have a one on one or one off on that. But you'll see that in some of the global reach blogs if you ever go through and you see a bunch of buttons. That's usually reserved for much longer content. Um, but it's, it's a really easy way to help people jump around the content a little bit faster, a little easier. And the last thing, which I don't have on the slide, but it's very, very important, is you want to make sure that you have a good meta description and a title tag. So the meta description can be up to 160 characters, and it's kind of your elevator pitch. Now, Google says that it doesn't impact like keywords, uh, the algorithm that much, so it doesn't have that much keyword value. However, it does help with click-through rate, which is just as, if not more important even, than 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 your keywords. So you want to have a really good 160 character or less uh, meta description on every page that has to be unique. If it's blank, it looks like a duplicate and Google will just grab information off that page and use that to describe what's on it. And that's the last thing you want because frankly, if it grabs something that's irrelevant or grabs something from your footer and the content is about something completely different, then that's not helpful. Another uh, pro level tip that I'm going to tell you right now is that PDFs are great, but they don't have any SEO value. So if you have a link to a PDF and that opens in a new tab, um, the Google crawler will see that that's a document, but it won't look for keywords in that. So if you have really good PDFs, think about, look at it and think, okay, how can I extract this data? How can I take out images that we've already created, textual content, and use that to create content on the page and then maybe offer the PDF as a downloadable at the end. Um, the same is true for images. So if you have an image that has a great statistic in it, Google can't read that statistic. And so that statistic does no, does no good in terms of keyword value. So keep in mind, you're trying to work. I always like to say that SEO copywriting and well, SEO in general is the, the art where human psychology meets machine learning and, and the Google algorithm in the middle. Um, so it has to be engaging and enticing to the people that are visiting, but also easily accessible to Google. So I know I kind of have gone over the 30 minutes, um, so I'll kind of wrap this up. In conclusion, you're probably wondering, okay, so then what? You've written an awesome blog, you, you feel really good about it, 
So now what? A lot of times people think that they just post the blog, it's going to get found by Google. That's all that they need to do. Well, that's not true. You want to promote it. You can do emails, you can do social media posts, you can uh, do internal communication, which is fantastic. Uh, I'm a big fan of if you write a blog, post it on your company's LinkedIn, and then there's an option to notify employees. And that way, hopefully your employees will also promote that content for you um, and share it organically. And here's why that's important. When you share, we always say that, 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 uh, Digital marketing, specifically SEO, is many, many legs. It doesn't stop at your website. Google crawls all of the internet. So it is looking for anything related to that. So if somebody shares a link on Facebook or on, on Twitter or you know any social platform and it gets reshared and people are clicking through, Google doesn't see that as a Facebook post. What it sees it as is an individual or an organization sharing a link to content that has value. And as people click through, it shows that it has even more value. So make sure you're promoting it. Uh, it it's usually free you can do it if you want to promote it with a with a paid ad that's not a bad idea either just do a short one and then give it a week and follow up look at your analytics how did the post do um what keywords was it getting found for if 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 your google search console is tied to your google analytics you can see specifically the queries that people search for that had them land on that specific page so take notes and learn learn from it and and figure out what you could do a little bit better um, and don't be afraid to, to tweak the content if you need to. I wouldn't change it too much, but yeah. And then you want to repeat the process at least twice a month. Ideally, you want to have a post every other week. Um, some people do a post every week. And in fact, that's not a bad idea because you can take those four or five posts per week and turn them into a newsletter at the end of the week and send it out. And so it's, it's, easily, it's easy, an easy way to repurpose a lot of content that covers a lot of different subjects. Um, Another great tip is that if you use Instagram, for example, there's a great program called Mobile Monkey that you pay for, but it, it automates. It's like a chatbot. It automates your Instagram. And um, you can say, send me the keyword um, SEO masterclass, and we'll send you a great slide deck on what you should know. And the bot, the Mobile Monkey bot, will pick up that keyword in the DM and it'll automatically send them the link or send them the PDF or send them whatever it is, whatever the file is. So there's ways that you can automate to promote, but ultimately what you wanna remember is this, the audience follows you for your unique value that you provide. When you stop providing value, they're gonna stop following you. So that's pretty much all that I had on this subject. I appreciate you taking the time to hear me out. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, hopefully I've uh, done a, a decent job of, of walking you through all the things that you need to know. So anybody have any questions for me? Uh, so Lisa is asking if the slides are available. Um, they can be, sure. <laughs> uh, I finalized this slide deck about three minutes before I jumped in here. Didn't have a chance to run through it, so I'm glad that there weren't any major typos. Um, but yes, I can definitely get you the slide deck if it's something that you're interested in. We'd be happy to provide that, no problem. Um, and again, the video to this training will actually also be available. Now, I tend to talk very, very fast when I'm excited and passionate. So yeah, uh, just send an email to uh, seo at globalreach.com if you'd like that slide deck and I'll make sure that we get it to you. Um, but again, I, I tend to talk really fast. I tend to cover a lot of information. And so having this video available is a good, helpful way. And I'll try to make sure that we uh, annotate the, uh, if we do it on YouTube, I'll try to make sure that we annotate when certain points are so you can jump to it. Um, another, since I don't have any questions yet, um, another great uh, tip that I have for you is that remember who owns what. So YouTube is owned by Google. YouTube is the second largest search engine on the planet. The Google algorithm reads everything anyway, right? Manu, you have a Facebook question. Fantastic. Let me answer that in just a second. I want to finish this thought. So by optimizing your video description, you have 5,000 characters that you can put in that video description. So by taking blog content, for example, turning it into a video, and then taking the actual textual content of that blog, putting it into the description of YouTube, of the YouTube video, and linking back to that, you've created link juice and keywords that tie back to your brand. Then you embed that video in the blog, and it's basically cross-promoting itself. Super easy way to do it, really easy thing. And then also promoting uh, posts through Google My Business is huge too. That's another low-hanging fruit. Um, Madhu has a Facebook question. I'm happy to answer it. What can I answer for you? So, Stephen, I, Facebook seems to have blocked my... Um, 
ability to put an ad in or boost. And I feel like I've done everything in the world to try to fix it. And I don't know what to do next. <laughs> sure. Sure. I actually, um, do me a favor and uh, send me an email. Uh, you have my personal email, so feel yes. free to send it to me. But send me an email requesting uh, the articles. Facebook put out a few articles on that very subject very recently, and I'd be happy to get them to you. Essentially, what's happened is this. Um, it's a little off the subject of SEO copywriting, but that's totally fine. I know. Sorry about it's that. It's okay. No problem. I'm happy to help because I'm sure other people may be wondering too. So uh, as you may have heard, Apple released the iOS 14 update, and it's about privacy. It's all about privacy. Well, the kicker is only about 40% of global Facebook users use Apple devices. Most are on Android. So because of these privacy settings, essentially what it said was you have to, you can't be tracked. Um, so you used to be able to use a Facebook pixel on your website um, and you used to be able to track user data like demographics, psychographics, geographic information, all that stuff that mm -hmm. you could use to remarket. And this new iOS update basically says you have to opt into that. You have to tell, and it used to be that we'd just be tracked no matter what. There's no regulation on this stuff really. So, uh, or very minimal, I should say. So if new iOS uh, 14 update, people who have that update don't opt in, then it will stop, essentially stop them from being tracked. And so you have to go into your Facebook ads manager account um, and essentially check a few settings, change a few things, uh, maybe even reinstall a pixel. If you have a Facebook pixel on your website, there's a new pixel you have to use. And then also for conversion, it's asking you to set up a new conversion pixel. So there's a little bit more if you're doing anything using the pixels. Um, otherwise, it's possible that if your content has been flagged for some reason as uh, assuming things about your audience uh, that are considered negative in any way, shape or form, it's remember, this is all run essentially by AI. So, you know, it's not always right. But um, there's that. And then if there if there's any kind of political tinge, and you forgot to check that you wanted it to be a political thing, um, or if it's job related and you forgot to check that, those are reasons that Facebook might pull your ads. Um, now, when you build out your ads, are you doing it through like boost, just boosting a post or are you doing it through um, the ads builder in the background? Ads builder. So I've done both. I've done mm -hmm. boost post. I've done um, Facebook like ads. Mm -hmm. And they all were working great for years. And just the last um, month, maybe no, two months, they've just all of them, all of a sudden, it is no longer, um, they just blocked me out. And um, I, I've done everything. I've like re updated, and it just won't let me do it. Yeah. So, um, that's a great question, and I am not entirely certain why it's blocking without diving into it. But again, if you send me that email requesting the, the information, I'll be happy to um, to get that to you because I do have some links that might be able to. And if not, I have some links to. Um, so Facebook's funny like that. When it comes to page or business manager support, it's not all that great. But when it comes to, hey, you can't take my money right now, they seem to pay attention. Weird how that works. So I know, it, but I'm like, take my money. <laughs> yeah, right. So we have. It's funny. I actually, um, for when we've had customers who have issues like this, who who pay us to do it, um, we actually have like a an open chat that's left there with fa Facebook's support. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's, it's a really easy way to make sure that you are. Um, communicating with the right people. So it's like an open chat that just sits off to the side and we say, hey, we have an issue with this account. Here's the here's the Facebook ad ID and all that stuff and seems to get through. So I'll, I'll uh, send you some uh, support links that I think will be helpful. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's um, okay, I'll, I'll work on that. Like I said, I've spent hours on it and I can't seem to figure it out. I have another Facebook question. So when I post something as a blog, Mm -hmm. on my website and it was a graphic it cut off the top and the bottom only in my cell phone it doesn't cut that it's it's the mobile friendly image i'm not talking about inside i understand we need to add mobile friendly image 
into the photo when it's part of the blog page um, article. But this is the image that goes right below where you write the title of the blog. Yeah, introduction. Yeah, introductory image. I totally know what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah. So uh, now you're saying that when you post it to Facebook, it cuts that off? Yes, it cut off yeah. the... It's so the image itself uh, is not, uh, it's not, so, so <laughs> Facebook has identified that that's the image that we want to use to announce this blog. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the problem is that that image itself isn't sized 100% properly for Facebook. So it basically just tries to fit it in there. Um, in fact, hold on just a sec, yalrh.com slash blog. Um, last month, we did a uh, complete guide on, on sizing. Um, okay. Yeah, so you I'm going to find that. Okay. And you can also. I have, your, I have your uh, sizing image guide. I looked at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the 2021 image sizing cheat sheet. No, well, I have the old one, I guess. Here, this is this is uh, the blog that we did that breaks down just about every social platform there is and, and what sizes things need to be. So for those of okay. you who are still following along, it's in the, the chat there. Um, and that's that will give some, some good information there. And then also, copy link address, um, the other blog that we did at the beginning of May, or mid-May rather, was about this iOS 14.5 update. So I'm going to include the link to that in the description here as well. Mm -hmm. um, both of those have some really good information about, you know, the two things that you seem to be pretty, pretty concerned with. Um, <laughs> generally speaking, our blog is a great source of information. If you haven't subscribed to it, I highly recommend it. Um, a lot of the tips and tricks that we provide in these monthly sessions, as well as in our consulting sessions with clients end up becoming blogs or, you know, we, in the digital marketing department, we tend to be addicted to this stuff. We want to be on the bleeding edge of the latest trends and changes. So mm -hmm. to do that, uh, we tend to put a lot of this stuff out there. But um, the other solution for you, you're using SiteViz. And so one of the things you could do is if you send an email to your account manager and let them know that you'd like a certain image to be the OG image, um, that stands for Open Graph Protocol. And it will essentially, they can set it up so th that image is the image, even if it's not shown on the front of your your page. So say it's the image you're talking about, but it's properly sized according to what I just sent. Um, if you send that image and ask them to add it as an OG image on the back end of your website, then if you post it to both Facebook or LinkedIn, it'll grab that image and know that that's the image it's supposed to display. Um, but that's like every single time. Like, you know, if I write a new blog, then I have to send it again. Yeah, I think that the best thing that you can do, because ultimately the way that our blogging is set up is that you, when you're using SiteViz, is that you essentially tell it what the hero image is. It tell, you tell it what you want the primary image to be. If yes. you try and make sure that that image is sized to the Facebook standard that, that is mentioned in that blog, um, you should be fine. I, I We've found there's a certain uh, size uh, dimension that we use for all of our blogs, and, and we found that it very seldom if ever gets cut off on essentially anything really, but yeah. So. Okay. Um, so it's in that, it's in that uh, link you just sent me. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, in All fact, right. it's got, that's a great example of the anchor text. If you want to jump straight to Facebook, there's an anchor text at the top that you can click on and it'll jump right to where Facebook sizes are. Okay. Uh, yep. Okay. So, I'm, and for those who didn't see the chat or haven't kept an eye on it, Lisa C. had asked about alternate uh, text on images and whether or not that's important. And I, I mentioned that very briefly. I kind of glossed over it. But, yeah, it is important. Um, and so, essentially, you want it to be the very, very best um, – the, you want it to be the very best content possible um, in terms of, of describing what is in that image. So ideally to avoid um, any kind of discrimination, what you want to do is say um, you want to, you want to have, make sure that somebody who is using descriptive technology, a screen reader, for example, if instead of just saying image, it'll say image of a man standing by a pond so that it adds that visual element. Um, and, and if you want to really, up your game, add your branding. So for example, uh, image by global reach of a man standing by a pond. So that way you have 
Global Reach's name in there as well, or whatever, you, I wouldn't say Global Reach for everybody, obviously, whatever your company is, whatever your brand is. And that way the screen reader can see that. But again, it helps it get pulled up for, for Google as well. So the more um, ADA compliant and, and user friendly your site is, the higher it's gonna rank as well. That helps as well. Um, Lisa also asked if there was a minimum amount of words that you should use in a blog. And yes, the bare, bare minimum is 600, but I, I recommend higher to, to 1200 if at all possible. Um, we've seen that the trend lately has been super long form content, which is a monster to write. And you maybe do it once a month, once every other month, but it's 7,000 words. And in a 7,000 word blog, you actually will be able to um, reach quite a few more people. I'm actually looking, I, I wrote this down. I have a little cheat sheet. I keep tabs on all this stuff, but a 7,000 word blog will actually give you, uh, again, 7% higher click through rate. Um, there's just a, a lot of different stuff on there. Here we go. So you get four times more traffic. Uh, if you have lists in them, you'll get more page views. Um, one list every 500 words is what's recommended. Uh, titles that have between 10 and 13 words get two times more traffic and one and a half times more shares. Um, lists and how to's do the best followed by guides um, and using numbers in the title tends to help as well. Um, that visual element of the uh, H2 through H4 hierarchy is important. And as far as if you have a set, if you decide to tackle that monster blog of 7,000 plus words, um, you want to have at least, you want to have one video and up to seven images total. So breaking up the content, making it more digestible, it's actually a psychological hack because you're able to um, trick the mind into thinking there's less content there because it's more digestible than if it's, it, then, then if it was just a big block, people tend to see that giant block of text and go subconsciously, oh, that's hard. That's all to read. I don't have time for that. Whereas if it's more digestible and it's four to five lines of text, people will go, oh, okay, yeah, I can do that. You know, it's just boom, 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 one onto the next, onto the next. And then, and before they know it, they're through the blog. Um, Matt chimed in with uh, our blog size, blog image size. So back to Madhu's question, jumping around. Um, the, our blog image sizes is 675 by 338. So 675 by 338 seems to be the, the sweet spot that we found. Um, the only reason I didn't know that off the top of my head is because I usually just send designer requests saying, hey, I need this image with, <laughs> and describe yeah, it. Yeah, of course. She's um, magic. So She's awesome. that, that image size, I'll try that. But I'm assuming then that just covers the whole page from end to end, that image. Uh, let me show because you. Right now, I just make them 300 yeah. by whatever. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the aspect ratio is the important thing. So, for example, this is this is our blog right now, and so you'll notice yeah, that this so it's image all the way across, right? So yeah, it, does, it takes up the the whole side. It leaves some in the navigation, and everybody's design is going to be a little bit different. But you'll notice all of these images basically fill out the whole thing. Now, honestly, if you have an image that's that is this is called landscape, if you have a portrait style, which is more like th this, that's fine. That's totally okay. But yet that's not going to be your hero image. That's not going to be the one that you share to social. Um, so if you go to my website, you can see that my image, I've been making them all that one size. And maybe I'm not wrong. I'm not, I should be making them different. That's what you're saying in a way. <laughs> Did I misspell it? I don't know. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Cuisine, Cuisine of India. C-U-I-S-I-N-E. It's, I put quiz nine. <laughs> uh, that happens. <laughs> okay. By that domain, make it redirect. So if you go to blog, see, I just made them uh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, zooming in and getting a, a, the aspect ratio close here with a higher quality picture would probably be a good idea. And and even if you have this right here, if you were to take this image, essentially cut it in half, right? And mm -hmm. use, I love that you're using UGC, user generated content. This is brilliant. And I absolutely love that you're doing that. But if you make this a longer image and add this color to the side, Canva is a great tool, a free tool that you can use, C-A-N-V-A, to create... Um, I'm obviously thing. using somebody to help me with this. So she created yeah. this. And yeah. so if I do the big one, it covers mm -hmm. the whole thing. So far, yeah. I haven't done it. I've just been using that size. 
Thank well, you. with it being adaptive, if it if you're using, I mean, I get why she's doing this because she wants to make sure it looks good on a cell phone. But if you're using, no, yeah, yeah. So if you're using, uh, uh, if it's an if it's a uh, an adaptive image, if it's a um, I can't think of the word off the top of my head, but if if it's the kind of image that's going to be mobile friendly, then it doesn't really matter what um, size, how much of the page it takes up, because it'll shrink to be the right size. So, um, for example, if I go back to our blog and I jump into any one of these, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. um, no matter what size this page is, it's going to adapt to fit the screen. Okay. So if you've done that right, and the nice thing is because the aspect ratio is what it needs to be, it's going to show up good on, on, uh, on, Facebook or anything else. So uh, to, to kind of prove that point, I know we're getting to the end of time here, but if I, if I take this URL, mm -hmm. I say, okay, I want to see how this is going to look in Facebook before I share it. Um, oh. there's, there's a great tool um, called the Facebook debugger. Um, oh, geez. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. But basically you plug it in here you hit okay. debug. And it will, uh, they call it scrubbing. So this hasn't, we haven't shared this on Facebook yet. So fetch new information. And now it's looking at it and it's telling me this is what it's going to look like. So I can see that the image fits, the description is, is decent, the header is good. Um, and there you go. And then it'll tell me how many, if I, so with this URL, if, if we had shared it, it would tell us the last time it was shared. It'll tell us how many likes and comments it got, all that fun stuff. It's called Facebook Debugger. It's the Facebook Debugger is the, the funny name for it. So I will also share that one as well in the uh, description here. Um, and there's one, there's a post inspection inspector, which does essentially the same thing for LinkedIn. But we've found, it's been our experience that nine times out of 10, if an image works on Facebook, then it will also uh, work well for, for uh, LinkedIn. But that is the Facebook debugger tool there. It looks like Matt wants to chime in. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, out of curiosity, I don't know if Steve, you know this for sure, but I know Facebook used to have a um, like rule of how much text you get on an image when you boost it. Is that could that be one of the issues that Madhu's face? When I saw her blogs, it looked like she had a lot of text on that image. That I I believe I'm finding mixed content online about the answer for this. It used to be so 25. They, used to be 20. And yeah, the answer is that it, it, as of last year, it was 20 to 25 percent. Now they've gotten rid of it. So you can have as much text as you want on an image okay, okay. as long as it looks good. Sure. Yeah, as long as it looks good on any device and it doesn't blur, that's fine. If it's a crappy quality image, then they might boot it. OK. Um, so so you, for that said, um, no, uh, Matt, that's not the reason, because this has been happening for a couple of months. This is the first one I put in with with words in it. So, um, or a graphic, I, I have other graphics, but this graphic just was part of the blog. So it's being pulled from the website. And uh, that's why the image is different than if I just loaded it on Facebook. Okay. Um, no, it just popped in my head and I didn't know if that was still a rule on Facebook. No. We used to be <laughs> able to, or you used to not be able to uh, boost stuff that had so much text in it. So um, I think I'm going to, I'm going to, we can keep talking for a minute here, but I will answer this question. I'm answering it in chat as well. Lisa was asking if there's a way to tell LinkedIn which image to pick up from a blog link. Um, sometimes it's good. Sometimes if you don't, if, if you don't, it's not, if you just don't put in your own image uh, and sometimes it is. So the way that it, it works the same with Facebook too. If you have no image in there, then a lot of times it won't get put an image in there. If you have an image in your, which you should always have some kind of an image in your blog. Um, but it's going to pick usually the first image it finds. Sometimes that's your logo and it'll distort the heck out of your logo. So it doesn't look great. Or the image, if it's sized improperly or it just doesn't look like I saw this, I've seen images. A great example of this actually was on Facebook. Um, they, uh, I want to say it was CBS or ABC. One of the news organizations was reporting that a, uh, so that a, a former basketball player had passed away. And the image that they chose for that article showed him jumping up and somebody else had their hand out and it looked super inappropriate. And for some reason, Facebook's algorithm cropped that image. So that's all you saw. You didn't even see the basketball player's face. So because they had the, the wrong image, 
it just looked awful. And the subject was about that this guy had passed away. So it, it, not, not a great PR move. This literally happened over the last 48 hours. It's probably still on Facebook. But I can see your question. The short answer is yes, there is a way. It's through OG tags. And um, that's the best way to make a recommendation of, which, of, of what uh, social platforms should look at. Um, on the back end of WordPress websites, you can actually go in using Yoast uh, SEO and you can dictate what you want that image to be. But uh, with us, and we've, we've been working on that functionality for, for a while now, we want to roll that out so that all site viz people can, can see it but, or, or have us do it. But uh, right now you would just send a message to your, um, to your account manager and they could get that taken care of for you. Um, otherwise, just make sure OG is open graph uh, protocol. But um, otherwise, just make sure you have a, a properly sized image somewhere in that blog and it'll most likely get picked up. Does that clarify your question? Mm -hmm. Happy to help. Um, so and it, does anybody else have any other questions we can answer before we wind, out, wind down here? I want to be respectful of people's time. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this month's Grip Tips and Training session. I thought that it would be a good idea to do an SEO masterclass. I thought that would be a, a fun one, and we had quite a turnout, so I do appreciate that. Uh, again, if you enjoyed this content, then by all means, when you see it on social, please do share it. Please check out our blog. We will be turning this content into a blog so you can see what, that we practice what we preach. Um, thank you very much. We're happy that you like the topic. Uh, and then in the future, if uh, we do this every month, so the RSVP page that you found that you RSVP'd on, you can actually click next and it'll take you the next month so you can actually RSVP on the next one as well. So thank you so much uh, for your time and for joining us. And if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to seo at globalreach.com. Have a safe and wonderful rest of your week.